speak Italian, so <laughs> I don't understand what he said. I hope it was good things. So anyhow, uh, I think I, I just saw a show of hands, and I think that's of people who work for NGOs here, right? OK, cool. So that's uh, the majority of the room. So I'm going to try and uh, customize my talk uh, for you today. So today I'm going to talk about how to raise sustain sustainable income streams as an NGO. It all starts with thinking about business. Now, as uh, NGOs, we are tempted to think that business is the enemy. Big business, you know, big brother. <laughs> Business is evil, <laughs> you know, those, those guys in suits are ruining it for everybody. You know, to a certain extent, of course, uh, this is true. You know, this is not a, a reputation that is entirely undeserved. However, think about it differently. What if business could be an effective form of activism? What if business could be an expressive form of art? What if business could be a creative expression of your spirituality? Now, we're not used to thinking of business in these terms. But there's actually nothing saying that business could not be any of these things. Now, when you think about activism, of course, the first thing we tend to think about is NGOs, nonprofits, civil society groups. Now, there's one. Achilles heel of all of these kinds of organizations and typically that's funding Funding is super problematic You know, I mean one of the problems with funding is it allows special interests <laughs> To tell you what you can and cannot do You know, I mean hopefully we're good at negotiating with these special interests to try and keep their influence out of it a bit You know, but this is really a problem trying to maintain your independence while receiving your funding from some third party, you know, who might have different ideas than you. It's no surprise to any of us these days that politics are not as friendly as they used to be. <laughs> I mean, given, you know, the wave of populism and whatnot in the world today, this is not increasing our funding sources. And in fact, our funding is drying up. So we need to think about different ways. We need to think about new ways of being able to ensure the continuity of our organization without you know, having to uh, pander too much <laughs> you know, to these uh, spe special interests. Um, another problem typically that is funding related that you might not think about is uh, thinking about a feedback cycle between where you're getting your funding from and so-called so the affected. <laughs> You know, I mean, typically the funding comes from one place and then who you're trying to help is somebody else. Now, with businesses and with the market, the nice thing is there is sort of like a closed loop in the cycle. If those who you are trying to help do not see a clear value of the deliver that you are trying to provide, then, you, well, you're bus you got a business. <laughs> You know, this is how it works typically also with businesses. Of course, with NGOs and nonprofits, it isn't always the same way, because oftentimes the funding tends to come from some subsidy, you know, agency or the government or wherever, it, or donations or wherever it comes from. And then us in the West tend to drop in from on high and say, thou shalt do things this way. At which point in the countries they're looking at us like, really? <laughs> you know, and I, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've seen technology that we thought would be helpful or projects that we thought would be helpful that would wind up failing <laughs> because we come in and then they don't understand why they need this or this doesn't fit their lifestyle <laughs> or this doesn't fit the, their workflow, the current way they do things. You know, and it's also oftentimes a problem from us, you know, in the West coming in as nonprofits trying to help a different group of people. The nice thing is, of course, if, the so if that project is coming from the community itself, it tends to have more of an uptake, <laughs> you know, as opposed to it's if it's coming from outside. But similarly, business also has this closed feedback loop that allows us to actually focus and target our actions in such a way that we can maximize for effectiveness. But uh, we do need to think especially, uh, again, about this subsidy trap. You know, 
typically you have the poverty trap. So everybody I'm sure is familiar with the poverty trap. You have someone who's poor and they're receiving welfare of some kind. Now, they need to get a job or they need to maybe start a business to pull themselves out of poverty. But then lo and behold, what happens, you know, if they start to earn too much money, they lose whatever welfare that they're getting, thus pushing them actually down, you know, back down into this poverty that they're actually trying to escape. You know, this poverty trap is a well-known phenomenon. What we don't realize is that as NGOs, we are also subject to a similar subsidy trap. Yeah? Subsidy agencies tend to say, well, we don't want NGOs starting businesses. You know? And if you guys start doing things that look too much like business, what happens? You're at risk of losing your subsidy. Or worse yet, you might even be at risk of losing your nonprofit status, which of course is very important to you so that uh, people who make donations can then, of course, uh, get uh, tax uh, reimbursements uh, on this. So it kind of leaves NGOs in a bit of a rock and a hard place situation. <laughs> because on the one hand, something like business could enable you to create a self-sustaining form you know, a financial basis for your activities and that helps you remain independent, you know, while at the same time being able to use this business as a vehicle for pure positive, positive impact in support of your activism. But then that actually requires getting the governments and getting the funders and getting those giving the donations to understand that this subsidy trap you know, this prohibition of allowing NGOs, nonprofits, and civil society groups from being able to start businesses in support of their work, that this prohibition is actually not helping anybody. <laughs> so, you know, and this is something, of course, that we can talk about. This is something that we can lobby for. Another thing that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense is going after little tiny pots of money. And that's exactly what subsidy is. If you think about the amount of money that governments give away, it's a fairly small amount and there's a lot of competition for these small pots of money. But think about it in another way. Think about the amount of money that governments spend on their suppliers. You know, think about how much money they spend on procurement. The, I mean, you know, if this is subsidy, this you know, is procurement. So together, we're chasing all of these infinitesimal, you know, t incredibly tiny pots of money, while actually, you know, the majority of the money from the government is going to, you know, the, the large accountancy firms, <laughs> you know, and uh, management consultancy bureaus, and, and a lot of big conglomerates, multinationals. This is actually where the big money is going. And when you go to the downtown of any large city, you see those really big glass buildings. That's where all the money is going. It's not going to you. However, we can think in terms of social procurement. I'm sure that you all are aware of the concept of social enterprise. I'm going to talk a bit about that concept later. But think about it this way. If NGOs could harness business as a way of providing a stable financial basis for your activism, Imagine if we could redirect even a fraction of that procurement budget towards social projects. The amount of impact that we can have with this is huge because the amount of t money that we are talking about is enormous. So I think that, you know, as change makers, we need to stop only thinking in terms of donations and subsidies. And rather, instead, we need to start thinking in terms of social procurement. There's a second related concept that is called social compliance. Now, everybody knows about compliance. Compliance, of course, is, um, hello. <laughs> Compliance is, uh, of course, you know, trying to be compliant with the legislation uh, that oftentimes uh, is dropped upon us by our countries or by the European Union uh, or other uh, ent entities. And this tends to promote a culture of fear. 
Yeah? Nine times out of 10, when poor procurement decisions are made, it's because somebody is trying to tick a checkbox <laughs> and they are trying to actually make as conservative pos of possible uh, of a decision because, you know, oftentimes those in companies, those in governments, they, they want rubber stamps, you know? And it's the typical, you know, nobody has ever been fired for buying from IBM. You know, it's this compliance culture that drives these conservative procurement decisions, which leads all this money to go to this big conglomerates and commercial corporate industry rather than going to more social businesses. So I think that we need to think then about the term social compliance. How can we get compliance officers to realize that they can be the new heroes of the modern age? <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> you know, and rather than just envisioning themselves as being boring and, you know, making maturity models and, and trying to get as many rubber stamps as possible, imagine if they took responsibility for getting compliance interpreted in the most social friendly way possible. Now, the problem is nobody is talking about this. You know, these are very powerful ideas, but very few people realize that this is actually even an issue, <laughs> you know, which of course starts with a discussion, it starts with discourse, you know, it starts with ideas, you know? <laughs> and as they say, you know, every re revolution starts with an idea. So people cannot make different decisions until they realize that these decisions are there to be made in the first place. So, you know, I'm not sure how many of you all are familiar with, uh, with Kate Rayworth. Uh, raise your hand if you are. Nobody? Oh, wow. Okay. Kate Rayworth is a really amazing economist who is part of this up and coming wave of economists called post growth economists. The term post growth was coined by Tim Jackson. He wrote a book called Prosperity Without Growth. And this new wave of economists questions the economy and they ask, you know, is this getting us where we need to go, you know, socially, environmentally? These economists ask questions like, why is it that our economy always has to be up and to the right? The moment that the economy flattens out, what happens? Recession, layoffs, suffering. Why is this? The answer that the economists provide is that there is so much extraction happening from our economy. And this extraction is happening in the form of dividends from stock and also from exits. In other words, acquisitions, mergers, IPOs, share buybacks. We are pulling so much value out of our companies and henceforth our economy that our economy and GDP has to remain growing just to maintain a steady state. But why is this problematic? This is problematic because this growth puts pressure on our societies. This pre growth puts pressure on our environment. And as those of you know about climate change, we cannot sustain this growth for too much longer. So Kate, uh, she has a really excellent TED Talk. I would highly recommend it uh, to everybody. And in her TED Talk, she asks, she makes these beautiful analogies about nature. She, take, for example, a tree. Now, at the very beginning of its life, a tree grows really quickly, <laughs> almost exponentially. But then, at a certain point, this growth of the tree starts to flatten off, and it stops growing, and it starts thriving. At this point, if the tree wants to grow further, well, it can't grow further. It's reached its maximum size, but it drops seeds. And those seeds become new little trees, and then those little trees grow to their maximum height, etc. Now, the question is, if this is how nature does it, why is it any different with our businesses? It seems in nature that exponential growth doesn't really work too well for us. The most prominent version of exponential growth that can be found in nature very well might be malignant, and it oftentimes kills you. 
I'm referring to cancer, of course. <laughs> but which brings us to this, the exponential curve. Anytime somebody wants to get into business, this is the very first thing that you see because this is taught to you in every MBA program, every startup incubator, pop culture, it's everywhere. We cannot get away from it. And this is also what I would like to call the Silicon Valley model of doing business. The Silicon Valley model has three parts to it. One, capital. Two, Scaling. Three, exit. Now we need to start questioning the legitimacy of this model. And we start, need to start asking ourselves the question, is this Silicon Valley exponential growth model getting us where we need to go? I think we need to start asking some questions about the different parts of this model. You know, we can start with exponential growth. Why? Why this exponential growth? I think that the exponential growth is purely in service of the exit. See, if you're not planning on selling out in roughly five years, why would you need to grow so fast? Yeah, pure and simple, you don't have to grow that fast. Slow, organic, and natural growth will get you there. But rather, we are taught to take a very short-term vision of our businesses, which leads us to make per, to have perverse incentives, which leads to incorrect decision making, causing us to take a short-term vision, which of course leads to all of these business consequences that do affect our societies and our environment. Similarly, with the exits, what if what if both venture capital and exits are actually in service of maintaining the status quo. Think about this. Venture capitalists, angels, you know, they, it, it's well known that if you get investors in your business, that they, you, you lose a measure of control over your business. Now, oftentimes, these investors have money, they have power, and you know what is good for them may not necessarily be good for you. <laughs> yeah? Similarly, with exits, it's very hard to maintain your autonomy <laughs> and your integrity after you have been purchased by a multinational or you have now just had an IPO and you are now owned by thousands of shareholders. You know, in all of these cases, you now have somebody larger telling you what to do, and guess what? They all want to see that 10x on your next result. You know, shareholder primacy. This is what is causing the incorrect decision making. If nobody else owns you, you make your own decisions. But the problem is that we are fundamentally being taught in our business educations that this is what success looks like. Think about business incubators. Think about the average newsletter that business incubators send out. Usually it's, you know, breakfast with VCs, learn how to make a better pitch deck, you know, <laughs> uh, learn more about exponentials. You know, this is what the startup industry is pushing. We also need to ask why. Think about the business models of your typical incubator. Incubators, most of the time, take equity in their startups, which means that if their startups grow exponentially and then exit, it means a giant windfall for the incubator. Could it be that where we are getting our business education from actually has a financial conflict of interest? There is another way to run an incubator. There are also incubators for example, uh, the Amsterdam Center for Entrepreneurship, uh, which is run by the Dutch university system. And what they do is they incubate companies for free. They do not request equity, but they say, if you make it big later, we would appreciate if you can pay back the costs that we put into your education. So in such a way, there is no equity transferred. They are, are not giving up control. And in such a way, one time, well, the Amsterdam Center of Entrepreneurship, I have been worked into their startup boot camp program, so I can give a one hour 
talk you know, on uh, post-growth and social entrepreneurship in their startup boot camp before you know, the uh, founders even make their startup, uh, sorry, their business model canvas. You know, this is what ACE is doing. I went to a different commercial incubator that will not be named, <laughs> and I asked them, you know, do you want me to also give a similar one-hour lecture to your founders? And they thought about it, and then they said, well, actually, I'm really sorry, because actually we are funded by an investment bank. So I actually don't think that they would like very much what you are going to tell our founders. Stop and think about this. They are turning down <laughs> the opportunity for no charge you know, to get a one-hour lecture on social entrepreneurship told to their founders. And they are turning it down because of their business model. <laughs> Nobody is talking about this. But I think that we need to start making some noise. Similarly with business education, we don't realize the amount of ideology that is actually embedded in the tools that we are receiving. So there's an interesting story. Occupy Wall Street organized a walkout of EC10, the Introduction to Economics class of Professor Gregory Mankiw at Harvard University. The students in the front row stood up and they said, we do not want the ideology that you are teaching in this class. And they walked out. Now, we need to ask the question, how much of what we're gaining in our education is tool, and how much of what we're gaining is ideology? We also need to start thinking about this in terms of incubators and MBA programs. So, you know, another thing is capital. It's, it's so-called common knowledge that everyone needs capital to start a successful startup. But I want to ask, you know, is this actually tool? Or is this statement actually ideology? I think that we haven't sufficiently questioned this. Now, I think that we can think about growing a startup in terms of throwing a dart at a dartboard. So let's say that this uh, here is a dart. <laughs> and let's say that this here is my dartboard. Now, there's two ways that I can solve this problem. Now, the first thing that I do is I stand all the way across the room, and I take a really big throw. You know, And if I have a good arm and a little bit of luck, maybe, just maybe, I will hit that dart right in the center. Or maybe I won't because playing darts is kind of hard. You know, similarly, there's a different approach that I can take. See, the other approach is that I take my dart and I walk across the room <laughs> and I gently place my dart in the middle of the target. Well, gee, that makes my life a whole lot easier. <laughs> but I would like to say that this is the difference between starting your business with capital and exponential growth versus bootstrapping. And bootstrapping means starting your business without capital. So let me explain. When you, I'm a software engineer, OK? I run a secure, computer security company. This is what I do. So, in engineering, in software engineering, we used to have this concept that was called the waterfall model of software engineering. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. But the way that it works is first you gather the requirements, then you architect the solution, <laughs> then you implement the solution, you deploy the solution, and then you pray like hell you got everything right. <laughs> That's basically what it is. Um, Needless to say, of course, this waterfall model of software design is obsolete. <laughs> Nobody does it this way anymore. <laughs> now we have agile, right? Lots of small, rapid iterations, two-week scrums, daily stand-ups. No, 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 but actually, no. as software engineers, we've gone even further than that. Now we have DevOps. Yes, so now we've got uh, 1,000 deploys a day. We've got continuous integration, continuous deployment, unit testing, you know? 
Now the question is, if software engineers have figured out that the way to build complex project, products with integrity is to start by spil building small atomic units with integrity and then slowly putting them together from the t bottom up, testing at every given moment that everything compiles, runs, works. <laughs> you know, why is it any different with our businesses? See, the problem with having capital is capital makes entrepreneurs lazy. See, when you have money, you want to spend it. So let's say I receive money from an investor. The first thing that I want to do is pay myself on day one because it's comfortable, right? <laughs> you know? And then what, maybe next I want to get an office because, you know, every business has an office. <laughs> You know, and then after that, uh, perhaps uh, maybe uh, comfy desk chairs, because, you know, we all like that. But the problem is, when we have money and we spend it, this creates something called a burn rate. You know, and the amount of capital that we have divided by the burn rate is our runway. And the runway is essentially the amount of time that a business can survive <laughs> before it runs out of money because it's operating in the red. <laughs> And then the whole thing, uh, essentially, you run out of cash, which leads you to the situation that either A, it falls over, or B, you have to go crawling back to your investors, who, of course, then probably want more of a stake and control in your company. See, the nice thing about starting with nothing is it forces you to get creative. <laughs> so, you know, what essentially happens is, uh, you know, when I started my own security company, I, well, I turned down a half a million euros from an angel investor, first of all, because I didn't want to give up any control over my business. But then it meant, you know, the consequence was I had no money. <laughs> but what did I do? I decided to build a platform organization. Yes, the same kind of platform as the Uber and the Airbnb, but there is actually nothing inherently unethical in platforms. The platform itself is not the problem. The business model is. So, you know, but that enabled me to match producers with consumers to provide a very basic service, in this case, com security consultancy, <laughs> and essentially to not have to have a whole bunch of capital because I only actually paid my ethical hackers when I had a paying customer. And so I was able to find a minimum viable platform and I was able to grow my business without needing capital at the beginning from the bottom up. Now, what people don't realize about business is that you can use services to bootstrap products, and you can also use bo products to bootstrap more complex things. So when one says, I need capital to start my company, I think we need to actually question, again, is this tool or is this ideology? This brings us to social enterprise. I'm sure some of you recognize the guy in this, in this picture. His name is Muhammad Yunus, and he is a Nobel Prize winning economist. He invented the microfinance, and he also started the Grameen Bank. He also wrote a book called Creating, Building Social Business, uh, which you know, many consider to be him to be the father of social enterprise. Now, Yunus defines social business as follows. No dividend business for solving human problems. No dividend business for solving human problems. Now, the Silicon Valley ecosystem jumped on his ideas, and they said, solving human problems, yes. But no dividend? Eh, that doesn't really work for me. <laughs> and thus evolved our social entrepreneurship ecosystem, which in, in, includes such concepts as impact investors and selling your B Corporation to Unilever. Leading people to start asking questions, well, actually, what is the difference between a social enterprise and a normal company that's just slightly less evil? And the truth is, even the social entrepreneurs do not know how to answer this question. But I think that we can realize that there is actually a spectrum of social enterprise, from the commercial to the nonprofit. The commercial end of the spectrum has been super well explored, but the not-for-profit end has been barely explored at all. And this is a green field ripe for exploration. 
And see, for me, this is actually a cause for optimism and hope because it means that there's something that we haven't tried yet. Another problem with social enterprise is that we tend to be laser focused on the sustainable development goals. Now, don't get me wrong, I love Africa, I love clean drinking water, I love solar panels. This is all incredibly sexy stuff. But the fundamental problem is that, you know, this is an incredibly tiny niche. Maybe 0.01% of all businesses have anything whatsoever to do with the SDGs. And then there's the other 99.99% .99 of businesses, you know, and they have nothing to do with the SDGs but those businesses are running the world. <laughs> so I think we need to ask ourselves the question, how do we take that other 99.99% .99 of businesses, I like to call them boring but necessary, <laughs> and how do we make them social? How do we make the plumber social? How do we make the Chinese restaurant on the corner social? See, if we can figure this out, you know, then we can allow the majority of businesses in the world, no matter how mundane, to decouple their profit motive from business as an operational vehicle to re-envision themselves as a vehicle for pure positive impact. Which leads me to the definition of what I would like to call post-growth business. Yeah? If you take the concept of a post-growth economy and translate that into economic terms, what would that, in entrepreneurial terms, what would that look like? Now, I think that there's three parts to the equation. First of all, no dividend. Second of all, no investment. Third of all, no exits. Which is exactly the opposite of the Silicon Valley model. So many business people with a lot of experience will look at this and they're gonna say, well, this is completely useless. Yeah, and for their purposes, they might be right. <laughs> but I believe if you want to build a business of pure integrity, I think that these characteristics are necessary. Sometimes we want to build more capital intensive products. And sometimes, in fact, we even want to build ethical supply chains. Another story, an, ex an instructive example, is the Fairphone. And the Fairphone is an incredibly amazing company that is developing a smartphone with conflict-free minerals and metals. Now, the CEO, Boss Fonabel, he is a hero. You know, he knew nothing about making cell phones, but he started a crowdfunding campaign and managed to succeed and raise the amount of money. Then he went to the local telecom companies and got a whole bunch of pre-orders. And then he was sitting on this big pot of money. And then he said, Crap, now I have to build it. <laughs> so what did he do? He went to Shenzhen because, you know, they know how to make cell phones. <laughs> so he, you know, let's say that there's about 400 components in your average cell phone. Now he went to the suppliers of each of these 400 components and he looked for the fairest suppliers. And then he said to each of those, the fairest of those suppliers, he said that to them, please, would you behave fairly? Now, to make a long story short, he went back two years later, and then it turns out that actually much of the Fairphone was still not fair. <laughs> you know, it turns out that they were actually not the largest customer of these vendors, and they did not change their behavior. Now, this, of course, was not the fault of Boss. He's an amazing guy. He was trying his best. He had a crisis of conscience over, conscience over this and literally wound up checking himself into the mental hospital with a nervous breakdown, you know? He tried his best. But what he learned was, you know, firsthand is that it is incredibly difficult to create ethical supply chains from the top down. But then the question is, if not from the top down, how else can you do it? Well, maybe from the bottom up. So let's forget for a moment about the fair phone. Let me ask you the question. If one out of the 400 components in a phone is an LED, can you make a fair LED? Eh, that's probably already difficult. So, you know, forget for a moment then the fair LED. You know, what is an LED? Glass, metal, a diode? Can you make a fair diode? 
I mean, that's already pretty hard too, but let's say that somebody's uncle has a semiconductor factory and they know how to make a fair diode. Now you still don't have a fair phone, but you can now make with your fair diode one four hundredth of every phone fair. And perhaps you can also use this diode to make one one hundredth of a fair Fitbit and one tenth of a fair bicycle light. And this is how we do it. <laughs> you take, you use reductionistic engineering logic to take whatever problem you are trying to solve, break it down into smaller pieces, and then create a shopping list of post-growth, boring but necessary companies that can then provide that solution. Still too complicated? Break it down again. Still too complicated? Break it down again. Break it down again. Until finally someone says, hey, I know how to do that. And then you take those small and atomic, <laughs> boring but necessary post-growth companies that are ethical by design and decouple their profit motive from the operational uh, operation of business fully and then you build ethical supply chains from the bottom up. Now we are already familiar with the phenomenon of taking atomic units that are very simple and then combining them into networks with emergent qualities you know, that can create complex and sublimely beautiful things. We have seen this before. It's called the internet. <laughs> so, you know, I'm a former assistant professor of computer science. You know, I am as in love with technology as anybody else. But after all of my years of being a technologist and also being CEO of a tech company, I've come to believe that the majority of problems in this world are not technology problems. They're business model problems. You know, coming back to the SDGs, there's an amazing book called Drawdown by Paul Hawken, which talks about the 100 most effective ways to reclaim carbon from our atmosphere. The number one most effective way is a uh, onshore wind turbine. Now, with all 100 of these solutions in the book, you know, these technologies already exist. The problem is they have a chicken and egg problem with their financing. And that is the reason why they are not deployed. These are not technology problems. These are business model problems. And I think we need to start asking ourselves, anytime the startup ecosystem or those who want to do good start getting laser focused on technology, we need to ask ourselves, are we doing the right thing? And furthermore, I want to take that question a step further and ask, can we, re re can we reframe every technology problem? as a business model problem. Which brings me back to radically open security. Again, my post-growth, not-for-profit, computer security consultancy company. I started my company as something called a fiscal fundraising institution, which is a construct we stole from the Dutch church. <laughs> Sometimes the church wants to make a commercial spin-off, and it gives 90% of its profits back to the church with a tax benefit. So I decided to make my security consultancy company the, the commercial spin-off and my church the NLNet Foundation. And NLNet is a not-for-profit charitable foundation that supports open source digital rights and everything for a better internet. So I built into the core of my business <laughs> that we would give all of our profits to charity, thus decoupling profit motive from the operational vehicle of business. After year th the close of our third book year, we already gave our first donation of all of our profits, actually 90% of our profits, to NLNet, basically leading us, after, just after three years of being a startup, giving 140,000 euros to the NLNet Foundation. What you are seeing here is a new revenue stream for NGOs. And you know, it's not magic. Anyone can do this. It just requires NGOs realizing that they can start up their own fiscal fundraising institution companies in which all of the profits of this organization can be redirected back to your nonprofit 
back to your NGO. This is new. So on top of this, I created the world's first post-growth startup incubator called Nonprofit Ventures, where I've been working with our first class of startup founders you know, to teach them also how to re-envision business as a vehicle for pure positive impact, but then in areas outside of cybersecurity. I also worked together uh, with Neil Thompson uh, from the Free University of Amsterdam, and we even designed a class called Post-Growth Entrepreneurship that we just finished piloting. It was six times two contact hours, and we think that this course will be added to the course catalog and worth ECTS points for the next school year. So we are literally working on rewriting the business school curriculum. I've won quite a few awards for this. Uh, Radically Open Security was called the 50th most innovative SME in the Netherlands. And CIO Magazine also called me the most innovative IT leader in the Netherlands. And also, the European Commission called me one of the eight most innovative women in the European Union. Now, it's not about me. It's about these ideas. <laughs> The Euro Europe sees this actually as an opportunity to do something a bit differently than the United States. <laughs> and in fact, we, this is an opportunity. We can finally re-envision business in such a way to make it more social. Because of course, here in Europe, <laughs> we're used to doing things a bit more social. So this is something that can be promoted. And the other thing, a reason, of course, that this is getting recognized is this is not just theory. We have actually built this, and we have actually demonstrated this. So I want to, all of you here in the room today as NGOs to think about, can I start my own supporting business, my own fiscal fundraising institution, not just to help raise funds sustainably for my organization, but actually to help create this post-growth economy, because we can create the post-growth economy one startup at a time. Thank you. Thank you so much. We, I think we have time just for one question. Yes. Uh, well, thank you. Your talk was very, very interesting. Uh, actually, uh, we are a startup, and we just started. Uh, we want to create a transportable and low-cost de device for treatment and transportation of burned children in Africa and Asia. Um, actually, we come from a period where they thought a lot about the Silicon Valley model. And if I have to say something about your presentation is that uh, the Silicon Valley model uh, can bring many good examples of very huge success. Uh, how can we think surviving and growing maybe with a model like the one you propose? I'm not going to say that you can't create successful companies with uh, the Silicon Valley model. However, I think you need to ask yourself, what is my definition of success? The problem is we are being taught in school that success, success looks like Mark Zuckerberg, you know? <laughs> and, and, and it looks like Larry Page and Sergey Brin. I mean, sure, they've built great companies, but imagine if they hadn't had investors at the beginning, how much greater they could have possibly been. Oftentimes, we have choices between integrity and growth. If you choose for growth and you water down your integrity, at the end you might get large, but what have you built? I mean, take Google as an example. Google started as don't be evil, <laughs> but they accepted venture capital. At a certain point, Larry Page was then replaced as CEO by Eric Schmidt. Then they acquired DoubleClick, and then somewhere around then, don't be evil just kind of disappeared. <laughs> I mean, I don't necessarily think you know, this is the fault of Larry and Sergey, <laughs> but they're part of this system. So I think sometimes that we just need to understand that you know, this system is a choice. You know? When I first realized about this system, I felt like with all of this stuff, I was seeing the matrix for the first time. You know? <laughs> and then 
for us as entrepreneurs, I still think we need to then make the choice. Do I take the red pill or do I take the blue pill? Do I continue building business as usual or do I embark on a new way? Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.